On 27th of January 2009, at 04.36 in the morning, an ATF-42 operated by Empire Airlines on behalf of FedEx entered an aerodynamic stall and crashed short of the runway at Lubbock Airport in Texas, United States. Hi, my name is Magnar Nordahl. I'm a captain and instructor on ATAR aircraft. In this video, I will talk about the factor that affects flight safety, and that is fatigue related to night shifts. As an example, I will use Empire Airlines Flight 8284, an ATR 42 that stalled and impacted the ground while on approach. I have seen some videos about this accident where the narrative has been focused on the errors made by the crew. But those videos missed a crucial point. This accident happened at 04.36 in the morning, a time of the day where the human body is supposed to be at sleep. Our body follows a 24-hour cycle, which is called the circadian rhythm. During the day, the body temperature and level of alertness varies. Between midnight and 6 o'clock, the circadian activity is reduced, reaching a low between 3 and 5 o'clock, when the body temperature is at the lowest. Most people will need 7 to 8 hours of sleep to feel rested when they wake up in the morning. Our sleep is controlled by a hormone called melatonin. When it's getting dark in the evening, the pineal gland in the brain starts to produce melatonin. The production stops when it's getting bright in the morning. This facilitates a transition to sleep and promotes consistent quality rest. Many pilots, and especially cargo pilots, work at night. And this affects the circadian rhythm, and therefore the performance of the pilots. Research suggests that the adjustment to night activity is possible, and, under ideal conditions, the adjustment occurs about one hour per day. This is the same time I experience when I travel east or west. When I cross six time zones, it usually takes me six days to recover fully, especially when I travel from west to east. However, a NASA study examining pilots in overnight cargo operations found that the circadian clock of pilots did not shift completely as measured by body temperature. The circadian law was delayed about three hours after five days of night flying. The crew of Empire Airlines Flight 8284 consisted of a captain, age 52, and a first officer, age 26. The captain had a total of almost 14,000 flight hours, where of 2,000 hours in ATF-42. The first officer had a total of 2,100 hours, where of 130 hours in ATF-42. Both crew members took some actions before the accident flight to reduce the likelihood of performance decrements during the night time hours. During the week before the accident flight, the first officer was on duty during the night hours. Then, she was off duty from 23rd to 26th of January. The first officer stated that because she had acclimated herself to sleeping during the days and being awake at night, she remained on that sleep-wake schedule during her off-duty days. During the three days before the accident, she went to bed about 6 in the morning and awake between 2 and 3 in the afternoon. Based on these times, the first officer went to bed before sunrise, thus avoiding morning sunlight, and awoke before sunset, allowing exposure to bright daylight before reporting on duty, which would have contributed to her ability to shift her circadian clock. In the 72 hours before the accident, she had 25 and a half hours of sleep opportunity, and she indicated that she felt rested on the evening of the accident flight. On the night before the accident trip, the captain went to sleep about 10 p.m. But to prepare himself for the upcoming night flight, he awoke about 4 o'clock in the morning on the 26th. Later that afternoon, he had a nap from about 11 to 16.30 which gave a five and a half hour sleep opportunity. The captain stated that he felt rested on the evening of the accident. However, because the accident occurred during the window of a circadian low, the captain was likely experiencing some fatigue 
as his body was not fully adapted to the night shift. Empire 8284 was a cargo flight from Fort Worth Alliance Airport in Texas to Lubbock Preston Smith International Airport in Texas. The weather forecast for Lubbock at the time of arrival was reduced visibility, overcast and light freezing drizzle. According to the General Operations Manual of Empire Airlines, aircraft may land when light freezing rain, light or moderate freezing drizzle or light moderate or heavy snow is falling. However, the ATR-42 Airplane Flight Manual AFM, does not allow flight into freezing precipitation because it's outside the certification parameters for transport category airplanes. Consequently, this flight should not have happened. The airplane did accumulate ice during descent and approach. The anti-icing and de-icing system worked as they should, but they could not fully prevent buildup of some residual ice on the wings which increased the stall speed. ATR has procedures to protect you against this. The speeds in icing conditions are increased and those speeds are shown on a speed card like this. Here are the speeds for normal atmospheric conditions and here are the speeds for icing conditions. Furthermore, the stall warning system will be activated at less angle of attack than for normal conditions. The captain was pilot flying for the first part of the flight. When they get closer to the destination, the captain did approach briefing. And here the crew made the first of several mistakes. When the captain briefed the speeds, he got them wrong. At the current weight, 33,000 pounds or 15 tons, the correct speed should have been approach speed in icing conditions, 116 knots, set with the amber speedberg. Go around speed 121 knots set with a yellow bug. Final takeoff speed with flap 15 in icing conditions 123 knots set with a white bug. Flap 0 speed in icing conditions 143 knots set with a red bug. Instead, the captain briefed the speeds to be 106, 112, 123, and 143 knots respectively. But 106 is V1 and rotation speed, and 112 is V2. Those speeds are used for takeoff. So, how could this happen? The answer is lack of vigilance because the crew experienced circadian low. When the crew contacted Lubbock approach, the controller informed the crew that the visibility was 2 miles or 3,200 meters, and that the ceiling was 500 feet. The crew agreed that this was within the limitations for the first officer, and she became pilot flying. They were given radar vectors for a straight in eyeless approach to the 917 right, which has a minima of 200 feet and half a mile visibility, or 800 meters. Here is a video from NTSB showing the last two and a half minutes of the flight. When the video starts, the aircraft is established on the ILS localizer. The speed is 166 knots and the height is 1580 feet above the airport. This is the status of the stick shaker. In icing conditions, it is activated when the angle of attack exceeds seven and a half degrees. And this is the status of the stick pressure. It is activated when the angle of attack exceeds 15 degrees. Here are the positions for the flight controls. This is local time, AM. The power should be about 40% at this phase of flight. When descending in landing configuration, the power should be about 20 to 25%. And here is the position of the left and right flaps. However, the indicator in the cockpit shows the position of the shaft connecting the left and right flaps. Finally, we have the status of the autopilot. It disconnects automatically when the stall warning is triggered. First, I will play the video as it is. Then I will explain it in more detail.
Five hundred. Pull up. Pull up. Okay, let's have a more detailed look at approach. The airplane is established on the ILS localizer at 5,000 feet, which is about 1,700 feet above the airport. However, since it was 17 degrees below standard, the true altitude was about 120 feet less, and they were about 1,580 feet above the airport, as shown here. The approach controller has instructed the flight to contact the tower. The captain's phraseology was not exactly ICAO standard. A more correct message would have been Le Tower, Empire 8284, established on the localizer runway 17 right, 9 miles out. The reply from the tower was more correct. Wind at 010 at 8 knots means that they had tailwind. The reason was that the minimum to the opposite runway was too high, and the other runways were closed. At this phase of the approach, the target speed is 160 knots. The power was increased a bit over its static decay in the airspeed, probably because of extra drag caused by ice on the airframe. Now, look here. The left flap was extending, but the right flap remained up. This asymmetrical flap condition caused the left wing to lift up. The autopilot compensated for this by applying left aileron down. However, the flaps indication in the cockpit was zero. Boy, this was a sloppy procedure. It's not a ATR procedure to do the before landing checklist before you actually are fully configured for landing. Furthermore, the captain never responded to the call for flaps and gear orally. And then, he read the checklist without receiving feedback from the first officer. This is a no-no, because it prevents the other pilot to cross-check the actions of the other pilot. And since they were not in landing configuration, the captain skipped two important items on the checklist, flaps 30 and max RPM. To sum it up, the procedures were non-standard and CRM was terrible, if it existed at all. Glidestar means that the autopilot catches the ILS glide slope and the airplane will start to descend. However, because there were no flaps, there were less drag and they had tailwind, so the aircraft started to accelerate. The first officer reduced the power, but it surprised her that the speed didn't reduce as expected. The altitude alert sounded when they were descending 250 feet below the selected altitude, which was still 5000 feet. However, when they captured the glide slope, they should have selected 6,000 feet, the altitude for missed approach. There was no call out for this. The flaps indicator showed zero. ATR 42300 and 320 don't have flaps asymmetric indication. All other ATR variants have it. 
a flaps asymmetric is identified by a frozen flaps indicator and a tendency to roll left or right. However, the airplane is fully controllable. During training, the pilots in the company were told to go around if the flaps didn't extend. But this crew did not do that. Neither did I discuss the problem and called for appropriate checklist. And that was the second big mistake. They didn't go around. Instead, the captain moved the flaps lever back and forth several times. Then he started to search for the circuit breaker for the flaps controller. What he didn't know is that when flaps asymmetric is detected, the electronic controller is de-energized and can only be reset on the ground. Furthermore, you are not allowed to reset a tripped circuit breaker in flight unless it's absolutely necessary for the safety of the flight. The actions of the captain distracted the first officer. Meanwhile, the power levers were still in idle and the speed was decreasing steadily. The auto marker is a small beacon that is used to cross-check that the airplane is at correct altitude when passing overhead. Today, a marker beacon is replaced by DME at most airports. At 1,000 feet above the runway, you must be stabilized. That means that you are in landing configuration and at correct speed, among other factors. But the flaps was not set, the condition level was not set, and the power was almost at idle. At this point, they should definitely have gone around. The first officer increased power slowly, but apparently she wasn't alerted by the low airspeed. I think I know why. Her speed bag was set to 106 knots, and that was her target. However, without flaps, minimum speeding icing conditions is the red bug, which in this case was 143 knots. And that was the third big mistake of the crew. The first officer didn't get any help from the captain because he was searching for the circuit breaker. The pitch of the airplane was now between 3 and 4 degrees up and they were descending on a 3 degree slope. That meant the angle of attack was 6 to 7 degrees. Remember, the stall warning is activated at 7.5 degrees. The stall warning triggered the stick shaker. At the same time, the autopilot is connected, but the alarm was muted by the stall warning. At this time, it was the captain's time to get surprised. Remember, he had been looking for a circuit breaker and had not monitored the flight at all. The company's stall recovery procedure told to the pilots was to set maximum power and reduce pitch. After this accident, and the fatal accident with Colgan Air Flight 3407 just two weeks later, the entire industry changed the stall recovery procedure to push the nose firmly down and add power. The first officer started to fly the aircraft manually and increased the power to 70%. However, she didn't lower the nose. This conversation shows a serious CRM problem. It is the pilot flying who initiates the procedures, including going around. It was written in the company's manuals and the first officer knew it. But the authority gradient was an obstacle for her. When talking with the accident investigators, she indicated that asking was her way of saying that she wanted to go around without stepping on toes. Right there, she missed her third opportunity to go around. However, the captain didn't do it better. Being the commander, he should have shown leadership and told the first officer to go around. He failed to do that three times. During post-accident interviews, the captain stated that he was trained to go around if a problem occurs during approach. Furthermore, he stated that he made a judgment not to go around because things started to piling up and it was better to land than to go around. He stated that he just wanted to land as soon as possible. As we know today, this was not the right decision. When problems pile up, it's time to take a deep breath and count slowly to 10. If they had made a go around, 
they will have time to sort out the problems and then make a new approach. At this point the captain looked over to the first officer and he was surprised to see that she was flying the approach manually. The captain offered to take control and the first officer was happy with that. The airplane was now too high on the glide slope and to the right of the localizer. The captain pushed the nose down and then he reduced the power. The sink rate increased and this resulted in a ground proximity warning alert. Oh, uh. Then the captain pulled hard on the control wheel. The increased G-load resulted in increased angle of attack and the stall warning was triggered. They got the runway in sight, but both power levers were close to idle and they were losing speed. The captain asked for max RPM, but the power levers were still in idle. When you increase RPM, the propeller drag increases momentarily. Just see how fast the speed was declining over the next few seconds. The stick shake was activated for half a second, but the power levers were still at idle. The stick shake activated again and the captain started to pull the nose up. This caused the right wing to stall. The captain started to apply power, left rudder and left aileron. When a wing drops like this, you must never ever apply opposite aileron because it increases the angle of attack of the stalled wing, deepening the stall. And then the stick pressure activated. That means the angle of attack was 15 degrees or more. The airplane impacted the ground just before the runway with 10 degrees bank to the right. This and high rate of descent caused the right hand landing gear to collapse. The airplane skidded off the runway and came to rest facing west. Here are the last seconds one more time. 500. Pull up. Pull up. Shortly after impact, a fire erupted in the right wing and because of the wind direction, the flames engulfed the fuselage. The crew opened the escape hatch in the ceiling, but the fire outside prevented them from using it. Instead, they evacuated via the aft left hand door. The crew noticed that they were close to the FedEx hangar and walked over there. It's understandable as the temperature was minus 8 degrees Celsius and it was 8 knots wind and both of them were injured. The captain received serious injuries and the first officer light injuries. However, when the fire and rescue team arrived at the scene, they didn't know about the whereabouts of the crew. Two firemen entered the burning airplane and searched for the pilots, and that put them at unnecessary risk. The cause for the flaps asymmetric has not been determined. It was the right hand flaps that failed and the, that wing was completely destroyed by the fire. Possible scenarios could be flap actuated jamming, mechanical restriction of the movement of the flap or hydraulic fluid contamination, but we will never know. To sum it up, this accident happened because the crew failed to follow procedures as laid down by the company and by the airplane manufacturer. They didn't go around when the flaps problem occurred. They continued the approach despite it was unstabilized. And they continued to aim for flaps 30 speed. Finally, they didn't apply correct stall recovery procedure. CRM was very poor. However, the first officer performed better than the captain, especially in the period before the approach. Why is it that it's always the captains who messed it up? If this had happened during the day, I am convinced that the outcome would have been very different. What do you think? Please leave your thoughts in the comment sections below here. 
Okay, that's all for this time. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day and happy learning.